military specialist for Carleton County. I'm going to give you the next presentation on Canada at World War One, Canada in World War One uh, in the Great War timeline. So, um, Canadians at Mount Sorrow. The newly created Canadian Corps found itself responsible for the most easterly projection of the Ypres salient at the beginning of June 1916. The second division held positions in front of Sentioli, which uh, was the last presentation that we did, where it had fought its first major battle, and that was at the newly Canadian Second uh, Corps. The first division under Major General Arthur Curry held positions centered on Hill 60, due north of the Ypres uh, Comines Railway. The remainder of the Corps front was held by the 3rd Canadian Division, newly formed under Major General Mercer. They held two miles of front with four battalions in frontline positions. On the 28th of May 1916, in an abrupt change of command, Lieutenant General uh, Edwin Alderson was appointed to the newly, to the largely ceremonial post of Inspector General of Canadian Forces in England and was succeeded by Lieutenant General Julian Bung as commander of the Canadian Corps. The 3rd Division held the only portion of the crest of the Ypres uh, Ridge still remaining in Allied possession, giving uh, Canadian troops the ability to observe movement in the enemy's trenches. They had the advantage of high ground from about 1,000 yards east of Zwartalin, next to Hill 60, extending over the flat knoll known as Mount Sorrel, and then over two slightly larger elevations, Hill 61 and Hill 62, before falling away to the Minin Road. So you can hear, you can see here, um, Hill 62, and this is Battle of Mount Sorrel, uh, and Hill 62, and that's, of course, um, in the 6th, uh, 19th, uh, 6th, so that's June um, 1916. Um, and Mount Sorrel is here, where the arrow is here. So top, that's Hill 62 here, and this is, of course, that's dated, uh, so June 9th. 1916. The new British front line, original German front line, and you can see here uh, the new British front line is a solid line, original is the dotted line, and so now the German front line here and the original here. So with the Brits being pushed back and now Finally, um, the Battle of Mount Soro um, is going to take place. Hill 62 was known, also known as Tor Top, from which a broad spur known as Observatory Ridge jutted about 1,000 yards due west. This protuberance covered in farmland split uh, Armag wood from sanctuary wood. Enemy capture um, of Tortop and further advance down Observatory Ridge would prove to be such a great threat given the commanding position it would prove behind friendly lines that such a move could even uh, compel withdrawal from the salient. At a minimum, such a move by the Germans would draw additional British resources to the area to counter such a threat. And the Germans were well aware of this threat. British resources relocated to Ypres would ob obviously be unavailable for use elsewhere. So this is June 2nd, 1916. Original German front line, 1st Canadian Division, um, and you can see, because for the Germans, the Germans have definitely uh, become, as seen here, that 
coming down into that position is a major threat. It did prove to be definitely a great threat. Maps based on the Battle of Mount Sorrel, and this is in uh, June 2nd to 13th of June 1916, in GWL Nicholson's Official History of the Canadian Army in the First World War. Um, the Canadian Expeditionary Force, um, 1914 to 1919, initial German successes on, on 2nd of June and 3rd June were largely reversed by the Canadian counterattack on uh, June 13th. As you can see here, um, from origin from the second all the way to the thirteenth, um, where the Canadians really have really have counterattacked. Um, the initial German attack on June second became such a great threat that they had to push back. They had to push back. It was there's no way they could be allowed to hold that. So this is Observatory Ridge and the corner of Almach Wood, taken from Mount Sorrel. One of the um, paintings of Canadian soldiers, or drawings of Canadian soldiers, one of the, uh, one uh, soldier with a Lewis gun, uh, one of the world's first light machine guns, three, three ammunition with a drum pan magazine, 47 round um, magazine atop the... Um, the light machine gun itself and that is you can have one with either 47 or 97 i believe these are are these were great they were light they were air cooled shroud cooled um they were excellent for even um anti-aircraft guns and even on uh, some of the airships as well um or uh they were good even on aircraft uh and mounted on armored vehicles the German 27th and 26th Infantry Divisions opposed the 1st and 3rd Canadian Divisions and were in fact preparing for an assault on Tour Top. German engineers had been reported by Canadian patrols in May to be pushing forward saps on either side of the heights. Machine guns and artillery was able to deter their progress. The sap heads were connected by a lateral trench by the end of May, 50 yards ahead of the main front line trench. Other saps were also observed in the vicinity of Mont Sorel and further south. Royal Flying Corps pilots reported life-size models of the Canadian positions at Tour Top behind enemy lines, which post-war histories confirmed to be practice trenches used by the German 26th Infantry Division for assault rehearsals. German activity across the lines, also indicated in attack, included the deployment of trench mortars of large caliber. Unusual activity by um, large caliber. Unusual activity by artillery, aircraft, and observation balloons. Poor weather prevented decent Allied observation of German rear areas to confirm suspicions of an attack, and no evidence of significant troop movements lent um, credence to a belief that such an attack was imminent. In actual fact, no additional troops were deployed by the Germans other than artillery. So the German attack that was on the night of June 1st and June 2nd, the German guns fell silent for seven hours and no artillery hit the Canadian trenches. The reason which the Canadians did not deduce was that enemy work parties were in no man's land clearing paths through the barbed wire and did not want their own artillery interfering with their work. Canadian suspicions were averted when the guns resumed firing later. At 0600 hours on June 2nd, General Mercer and Brigadier General Williams, commander of the 8th Brigade, sent out a reconnaissance of Tour Top and Mont Sorrel. They had reached the front line trenches of the 4th Canadian Mounted Rifles on the brigade right when the enemy's preliminary bombardment burst upon them. It was the Canadian Corps' first experience of the terrific violence that artillery preparation was to attain in the summer of 1916. All agreed, writes Lord Beaverbrook, that there was 
no comparison between the gunfire of April and of June, which was the heaviest endured by British troops up to that time. The bombardment lasted four hours, ranging over Canadian positions from half a mile west of Mount Sorrel itself to the northern flank of Sanctuary Wood. The 4th CMR was the hardest hit unit on the right flank of the 8th Brigade, while the 1st CMR and PPCLI, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, also came under heavy fire. The 4th CMR positions in front of Almark Wood dissolved into a clot of dust and dirt. In the words of a German observer, the trenches dissolved under the weight of fire. A feature known as the tunnel dug on the reserve on, a, on the reserve uh, sorry reverse slope of Mount Soro was used as a casualty collection point. This gallery, dug by sappers of the Second Canadian Tunneling Company, only offered temporary safety, as it too was it eventually destroyed by gunfire and the survivors captured. The 4th CMR suffered 626 killed and wounded, of a strength of 702 officers and men. The 76 men who came through unharmed represented an 89% casualty rate. So here's what we're looking at here. You can see Passchendaele, uh, Frenenburg, and St. Jean. There's the Eve Salient and uh, Court, Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae's medical station here. In the famous positions, uh, Polygon Wood, Sanctuary Wood, Hill 62 and Mount Sorrel, Hill 60 and St. Oli, and all these areas in here. It's all in close connection. Among the casualties were Major General Mercer. Fell in, uh, he fell by a broken leg and burst eardrums, then killed by shrapnel as he lay on the ground wounded. Brigadier General Mercer was wounded and taken prisoner by German infantry, assault infantry. Commanded by the, uh, so, oh, command of the 3rd Canadian Division was assumed temporarily by Brigadier General E.S. Hoor, Nern, uh, Nern, sorry, of the Lahore Divisional Artillery, and the 8th Brigade of Lieutenant Colonel J.C.L. Bott, commander of the 2nd CMR. Then Brigade Reserve. However, the transition was not made for several hours, and both formations were required to conduct a defense of their positions without leadership. Here's Canadian troops fixing bayonets on the Lee Enfield um, number three Mark ones. Sorry, number one Mark threes. Um, very good rifles. Enemy fire became more intense as the morning went on. Allied artillery was unable, was unable to respond effectively, nor could the two squadrons of British aircraft flying in support. Forward observation officers spotting for the artillery were killed or wounded by German shell fire, and all telephone lines back to the batteries were eventually cut. Just after 1 p.m., the enemy exploded four mines just short of Canadian trenches on Mount Sorrel. This was the signal for their attack and two division, two battalions of the 121st Infantry Regiment and two more of the 125th Infantry Regiment, both of the 26th Infantry Division, attacked on the right. On the left, two battalions of the 27th Infantry Division's 120th Regiment attacked Mount Sorrel. Five more German battalions remained in support with six additional battalions in reserve. In bright sunlight, the gray-coated figures advanced in four waves spaced about 75 yards apart. Afterwards, Canadian survivors spoke of the assured air and the almost leisurely pace of the attackers, who appeared confident that their artillery had blotted out all resistance. All was methodically planned. The men of the first line had fixed bayonets and carried hand grenades and wire cutters. Those who followed were uh, equipped with entrenching tools, floorboards, and sandbags. As they flowed over the flattened trenches, 
along Mount Sorrow and Tortop, they encountered only small, isolated bands of survivors from the 1st and 4th CMR, who could offer little effective resistance. There were brief episodes of hand-to-hand -hand fighting with bomb and bayonet, and where sheer numbers were not su sufficient to overcome resistance, the enemy used flame projectors, flamethrowers, the machine guns of Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry and the 5th Battalion, 1st Division, on the left and right flanks raked the attackers. Though they inflicted substantial casualties, they could not halt the advance. It remained for the 5th Battalion Canadian Mounted Rifles, holding a series of strong points immediately behind the 1st and 4th Battalions to check enemy um, attacks on the east and southeast sides of Maple Corps uh, Copes with ragged, rapid and accurate fire. Exploiting along Observatory Ridge, the Germans captured three strong points and overran a section of the 5th Battery, CFA, killing or wounding all of the gunners. Of this incident, a German regimental historian was to write, It is fitting to stress that here too the Canadians did not surrender, but at their guns defended themselves with re re revolvers to the last man. This German attack marked the only time that guns of the Canadian Corps fell into enemy hands. Two 18-pounders had been posed uh, posted well forward of, uh, on Observatory Ridge, deployed to camouflage pits within 400 yards of the front line as sacrifice guns in case of an emergency. Under the command of Lieutenant C.P. Cotton, the guns fired on German attackers at point-blank range and remained in action until the position was overrun. The three surviving gunners and two sappers manning the weapons with Lieutenant, Cur Lieutenant Cotton, were all killed or wounded. Both guns were later recovered during fighting on June 12th and June 13th. The Germans were able to seize the bulk of Armak Wood before consolidating and had forced the Allies back all along the line with the exception of the northernmost 600 yards of Canadian front line in Sanctuary Wood. Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry had one of its two forward companies overrun during the attack, but the second company emerged from the bombardment in relatively good order and was able to direct rifle fire into the enemy's right rear when it advanced. For 18 hours, the company of PPCLI held out, isolated, and with all its officers killed or wounded. Number one company of the PPCLI was badly hurt by the bombardment and as German fire slackened around 1 p.m. with half the company killed or wounded, both of the Patricia's flanks were open. To the right, the Canadian mounted rifles had been virtually destroyed. German infantry poured into the Canadian lines. Number two company posted on the Patricia's left, fired small arms into the right rear of the Germans swarming over the positions of number one company, number three company, and number four companies. In support and communications trenches behind the main front had to be redeployed to meet the new threat. At 3 p.m. the German advance seemed to stall all along the observatory ridge. Through Three more attack, though three more attacks went in against number two company that afternoon. They withdrew during the night, taking all weapons, stores, and casualties with, with them, and without suffering additional losses. The reserve companies defeated German attempts to reach the support line before Canadian reinforcements could arrive. The Patricia suffered 400 casualties in all, including 150 dead among whom was Lieutenant Colonel H. C. Buller, the commanding officer. These are, um, so we had two of these guys that were killed 
um, two of the many high uh, Canadian, uh, high-ranking Canadian officers killed during the recent heavy fighting around Ypres. That's yeah, so Lieutenant Colonel J. H. Baker uh, died of wounds, and Lieutenant Colonel H. G. Bowler, Princess Patricia's. And by the way, so this is um, all this data is is coming. A lot of this data is coming from CanadianSoldiers.com. This is it's an awesome uh, site. Um, I'm reading this off as a present, doing a presentation. So this is all great information. Um, there's all kinds of different information out there, including from the uh, Canadian War Museum, as well as other places directly on from uh, Heritage Canada. There's different uh, sites you can go to. Um, so under orders issued before the attack, the Germans dug in 600 to 700 yards west of their former line. Though short, of the position to be occupied in the most favorable case. Their formation histories reported the road to Ypres again open. Regret the break upon exploitation applied in advance by the command. Fortunately for the Canadians, no German officer had the initiative to exceed instructions and capitalize on success. Pressure to the north against the weakened defenders might well have rolled up the Canadian left wing, which had been so gallantly held by the Patricia Company backed by the Royal Canadian Regiment at Hooge. When the Canadians counterattacked, the new Corps Commander, Lieutenant General Julian Bung, pronounced that all ground taken by the Germans during the day would be retaken that night. The counterattack was hastily planned. Machine guns from the 10th Battalion, along with batteries from the Motor Machine Gun Brigade, were sent forward. The counterattack was ordered to begin at 2 a.m. The 10th Battalion moved to relieve the 7th Battalion in place so it could mass for the counterattack. The 1st Division placed two brigades at the disposal of the 1st Division due to the heavy losses. The 2nd Brigade would operate against Mount Soro and the 3rd against Tortop. The 7th Brigade of the 3rd Division, augmented by two battalions of the 9th Brigade, deployed on the left. The counterattack was delayed past 7 a.m. due to the distance to be traveled by units involved in the attack signal. S seven simultaneous green rockets proved troublesome. Fourteen rockets were employed due to misfires, and only six managed to burst, not bursting simultaneously, and with at least two of the involved battalions reporting having seen no rockets at all, units continued to await the start signal past the appointed zero hour. When the attack did commence, it was at different times. The 7th Battalion went forward on the right, the 14th and 15th Battalions in the center, and the 49th on the left. Rifle and machine gun fire was able to concentrate on each unit in turn, and all four suffered heavy casualties as they went across in broad daylight. Small numbers of Canadians reached the enemy line, where they proved unable to overcome the defenses in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and many losses were suffered there. By 1 p.m., three battalions had withdrawn, only the 49th on the left remaining in possession of some trenches just short of the previous German front line. In all, casualties for the 7th Brigade for the first four days of June totaled 1,050, all ranks. 1,050 lives of all, all ranks. The attacks had failed to regain the original Canadian line, but did close a 600-yard gap between Squarewood and Maple Corp. While advancing the Canadian line forward approximately 1,000 yards from where they had been pushed back, the line was now extended north toward Hoog, and positions in depth were constructed. The Germans 
also fortified their line with barbed wire, machine guns, and new communication trenches. With preparations underway for the Ju July di um, the July drive on the Somme, a big one coming up. The commander of all British troops in France, Sir Douglas Haig, was unwilling to divert more troops than necessary to the Ypres salient, even though he agreed with the local army commander, Gen General Plummer, that com German troops on high ground just two miles from Ypres was undesirable. Therefore, only limited resources were redirected to the sector. This included artillery and just one brigade of infantry. General Haig, seen here, suggested that the next counterattack be carried out with few infantry but many guns. This emphasis on artillery, which followed the tactics so successfully employed by the Germans at Saint Aoli, brought to the disposal of the GOCRA Canadian Corps, uh, Brigadier General H. E. Burstow, one of the greatest arrays of guns yet employed on so narrow a front. The 218 pieces, including 116 18 pounders and ranged in caliber up to two 12 inch howitzers. They represented the Canadian Corps' heavy artillery, the 1st and 2nd Divisional Artilleries, and the Lahore Divisional Artillery, the British 5th, 10th, 11th Heavy Artillery Groups, and 3rd Divisional Artillery, 51st Howitzer Battery, and 89th Siege Battery, and the South African 71st and 72nd Artillery Howitzer Batteries. The heavies of the British 5th, and 14th Corps on either flank were to cooperate. The main task of the artillery before the counterattack was to hamper the enemy's consolidation by pounding his front and support lines and seeking out hostile batteries for destruction. German accounts admit the success of this program. The losses of the 120th Regiment and the 26th Infantry Division mounted in horrifying numbers. What was constructed during the short nights was again destroyed in daytime. But bad flying weather made it impossible to register uh, the heavy guns, and the counterattack, originally set for 6th of June, had to be postponed. The Germans struck first, this time attacking the spur at Hooge, which had already changed hands several times since 1914. The most recent had been in August 1915, when the Germans had held it for eight days before being evicted. Overlooking e possession of the spur uh, now would give domin domination of the salient. The second division entered the fray when reliefs of the 6th Brigade came up from reserve and took over the 7th Brigade sector north of Sanctuary Wood to hold the extreme left of the Canadian Corps front. On June 6th, four large mines went off in the vicinity of 200 yards of trenches at about 3.05 p.m. Two companies of the 28th Battalion guarding the eastern sector, the eastern outskirts of Hooge ruins took heavy casualties. One company almost wiped out in the blasts. The remaining, the remained of the 28th joined with the 31st Battalion in pouring rifle and machine gun fire into the following German infantry attack. But it was no avail. But it was to no avail. As Hooge fell to the Germans, following the policy of the Commander-in-Chief Lieutenant General Bung of to leave the trenches at Hooge in German hands so as to limit operations in each salient and not hamper the preparations for the impending sum operation. Instead, the Canadians uh, concentrated on seizing Mount Sorrel and Tortop. To guard against further trouble on his left, the British 2nd Dismounted Cavalry Brigade 
organized in three battalions came on loan to the Canadian Corps as a counterattack force. 77 after further um, postponement and force as counterattack force 77 after further postponement because of bad weather the Canadian operation was set for 1.30 a.m. on the 13th. It was to be carried out mainly by the 1st Division because of the casualties suffered by units of two of his brigades in the unsuccessful counterattack on June 3rd. General Curry regrouped his stronger battalions into two composite brigades. Brigadier General Lipset on the right had the 1st, 3rd, 7th, and 8th battalions and for the attack on Tortop, Brigadier General G.S. Tuxford, 3rd Brigade, commanded the 2nd, 4th, 13th, and 16th Battalions. The 28th Battalion, 9th Brigade, plus a company at the 52nd, was to assault on the left. The 5th, 10th, 14th, and 15th Battalions were placed in a reserve brigade under Brigadier General Garnett Hughes. Four intense, four intense bombardments of 20 to 30 minutes duration carried out between the 9th and the 12th four times deluded the enemy into expecting an immediate attack. It was hoped that when none materialized, he would suppose the artillery preparation um, for the real thing to be merely another feint. For 10 hours on 12th of June, all German positions between Hill 60 and and Sanctuary Wood were shelled unremittingly, particularly attention, particular attention being given to the flanks from which machine gun fire might be expected to infiltrate the attackers. At 8.30 that morning, after an intense four-hour shelling that which proved uh, extremely accurate, the assaulting units moved up to their start lines in some cases in no man's land. For 45 minutes before zero, there was one more blasting by the heavy artillery, and then the attack went in, behind a dense smoke screen and a heavy rain. Brigadier General Burstall had hoped that with so much heavy artillery support, our infantry would be able to advance with slung rifles and events proved him very nearly right. In four long lines, the battalions pushed forward through the mud, each on a front of three companies from the right to the from the right to the left. The third, the sixteenth, and the thirteenth, and the fifty eighth battalions seen here where my cursor is, that's their attacking in. They were there were occasional checks by fire from some machine gun emplacements which had escaped destruction or from grenades hurled by isolated pockets of Germans. But the majority of the uh, Wurthenburgers, completely surprised and badly shaken, offered little resistance. Almost 200 were taken prisoner, the survivors falling back to the original German line. In an hour, the battle was virtually over. The first Canadian deliberately planned attack in any force, states the British official history, had resulted in an unqualified success. The 3rd Battalion had retaken Mount Soro. The 16th now held the northern part of Amakwood, and the 13th had cleared Observatory Ridge and Tor Top, and the attached 58th Battalion were reporting casualties of 165 all ranks had recovered much of the old line through uh, Sanctuary Wood. Between the 2nd and the 14th of June, the Canadian Corps' losses numbered approximately 8,000 men. In the same period, the Germans in that sector sustained 5,765 casualties. Inability to take effective countermeasures because of the Allied superiority in aeroplanes, artillery, 40 batteries to 28 German, and supplies of ammunition was cited by the Germans as their failure to hold their gains of the 2nd of June. They even judged the weather to be in our favor. 
for the continued the continual rain contributed to the softening up of the troops which were uh, exposed to heavy fire day and night it was a method uh, uh, meteorological viewpoint which the canadian veteran lying in lashing rain in no man's land until the assault or standing knee-deep in water in the assembly trenches might find difficult to share consolidation of the new front line began early on the 13th as did the enemy's bombardment as soon as he realized the extent of his lost positions in the morning of the 14th he launched two counter-attacks against mount sorrel both of which were broken up by our our artillery he subsequently advanced his own line to within 150 yards of ours the average distance which had uh, existed between the four positions before the second of june but made no further move to reopen the battle so you can see the strength alone i mean uh, as gory as it is two canadian divisions and one british division and the germans had three divisions so i mean we had more again uh so it was basically we had the equal amount um in the beginning but of course we had more artillery and aircraft um by the 12th and the 13th uh for this attack and, and it was and of course with the weather being in our favor it also helped um also in our favor obviously all right thank you ladies and gentlemen aaron boma military specialist for carlton county